Hey, Charlie Pyatt here on the second episode of the VR Enclosure Build. Last round we came up with a basic concept and knocked out some sketch renderings covering what the headset design might look like. So now it's time to get into the actual hardware side of things. The VR headset I'm going to be designing around is the Oculus 2, so I'll need to get one of those, tear it down, and see how I can fit the hardware into my new custom enclosure. So yeah, let's get to it. Gotta say, I mean, I'm absolutely not connected with Meta or the Oculus in any way, but this is a pretty amazing piece of tech. The Oculus has its own onboard processor and battery, so it can act as a standalone untethered VR headset, or it can connect to a PC through a USB in pass-through mode for better graphics and running games outside the Oculus store. Kind of gives you the best of both worlds, as it can run on its own or just act as a head-tracking VR system, all with good resolution and tracking specs. I picked up this one used for 250 bucks with the tracking controllers and everything, which is a crazy low price for something like this. That's also nice because I don't know if I'd be brave enough to tear apart a $1,500 headset on my own dime, so this is all working out. I'm not going into too much detail on how to tear down an Oculus 2, mainly because I did a pretty bad job going about it, and there are way better tutorials out there on how to do this. So to be honest, I really didn't know what to expect once I cracked this thing open. My biggest concern was that all the individual components would be mounted separately off the plastic enclosure. So like the displays, PCBs, sensors, batteries, cameras, and all that jazz would all be physically disconnected from each other inside the Oculus housing. If that had been the case, it would have been bad, like really project ending bad, because uh, I would have had to recreate all those precision mounting conditions, which would have taken more time than I was willing to put in on this project. Fortunately, the internal layout is pretty much a single isolated chunk of a unit that can be pulled out as one single thing. This is perfect for what I'm trying to do because I can just remount this whole unit in my custom chassis. Really couldn't ask for a better setup for what I'm trying to do. Right, so a rundown of what's happening here. Uh, you can see the main PCB, which is essentially a smartphone, uh, is laid out right behind the displays with a cooling fan on the front. There are four infrared cameras around the edge of the unit. These are for tracking the position of the touch controllers. You can see that these are attached to the main assembly and have to be in a very specific angle and orientation to make sure the hand tracking is accurate and doesn't drift. I'm guessing these cameras are affixed to this main assembly earlier in the manufacturing process so they can be QA tested and possibly calibrated before going into the plastic enclosure. In large consumer electronic projects like the Oculus, you can see a lot of time and effort goes into assembly sequence to minimize risks. You can see that in the parts that are not on this main assembly too. The buttons and ports are all connected through flex print circuits or FPCs. This means that if there needed to be a design change to the outside enclosure and these components had to move a couple of millimeters, it would be okay. You wouldn't need the electrical engineering team to do any redesign work. So, end of the day, this is all good news for me. I can leverage all those cost-driven decisions from manufacturing constraints to repurpose the Oculus into something new that's just for me much more easily. So next up, I need to get a digital model of the Oculus hardware into 3D space so I can start building my new enclosure around it. There are hundreds of 3D modeling software options out there, but very generally, you can separate them into two basic categories, parametric modelers and direct modeling software. Blender, Maya, Cinema 4D, and Modo are all examples of direct modelers, mainly used for game asset creation, 3D animation, and renderings and the like, with parametric programs like SolidWorks, Inventor, Katia, and Fusion 360s centered around making physical products and mechanical design. For this project, I'm going to be using Fusion 360 for CAD modeling and then exporting geometry over to Blender for all my rendering and animation. Parametric modeling is used for creating all the products around you that you use every day. To get an idea of what parametric modeling is, I did this simple part here in Fusion 360. It's just a mending plate, rectilinear bracket type thing, about as simple as you can get. You can see here in the lower bar is the feature tree. Uh, this is just a list of all the commands that make up this part. In this case, I made a sketch and extruded it up, made another sketch for the holes, and cut through the box. You can see that here is the first sketch, extrude up, second sketch for the holes, cut back down through the plate. Now let's say the plate needs to change because reasons, and I can just go in here to this first step and enter a new value for that length of the bracket. Say 200 millimeters, and finish sketch, boom, done. You can see my holes stay the same distance from the edges of my plate without me having to manually move them. 
simple way to think about parametric modeling is more like you're writing a simple computer program that creates your geometry with each feature in your feature tree being a little chunk of code. If you change a parameter in that program at the beginning of your steps, then it will impact all the later steps, hence the parametric part of parametric modeling. This is really important because if I have a complex model with thousands of holes that are all the same diameter and I need to change them, I can just type in a single new dimension and that will propagate throughout the entire model. If I was doing that in a direct 3D modeling software, I would have to individually change each dimension and hope I didn't miss any. Almost all the physical product stuff around us was made using some kind of parametric software. The chair you're sitting in, the device you're watching this on, that was all made with some kind of parametric workflow. But yeah, with the basics out of the way, I'm going to jump into modeling the Oculus 2 internals so I can build my own custom enclosure around it in 3D space. I'm just going to be using uh, calipers and a ruler to pull dimensions off the physical parts and reconstruct them in Fusion. If I was at a large company that was reverse engineering this part, I would probably 3D scan this thing, but high resolution scanners are super expensive and I find it's better just to dive in and do it manually on personal projects. I'm going to get into 3D scanning in a later video and go into the pros and cons of the different types of that whole situation then. But yeah, you can see I'm just building up the basic form to start with. I don't need to be absolutely spot on in most places. I really just need the cameras and mounting points to be semi-accurate in order to make this work. I absolutely didn't need to model those blades in, but I'm new to Fusion 360 and wanted to try some different modeling techniques just to get more comfortable with the software. And yeah, as a warning here, I make this look like I bang this all out in one go, and that's just not how it works. This is many, many hours of making little tweaks and adjustments, and then going back and making more tweaks and adjustments. Getting the tracking camera orientation was extremely tricky here as well. These cameras are tilted and rotated on all of the axes, so I spent a lot of time trying to get those right, and going back in and adjusting over and over again until they look like they're in the correct position. Now this is where I kind of realized something. I want to maintain all the functionality of the Oculus 2 so I can continue to use it as a standalone headset in the final custom enclosure. This means the view of those tracking cameras can't be obstructed by the enclosure or any of the new hardware I'm adding in. The cameras need to have a clear view of the hand tracking controllers at all times. Each one of these cameras are fisheye lenses that I think have a field of view between 110 degrees and 120 degrees. Couldn't for the life of me find an FOV spec of those online, which means I have to imagine the worst case scenario of a 120 degree cone coming off each little lens that can't be obstructed. So I have to also make sure the pass-through cameras and hand tracking module I talked about in the first video aren't intersecting those cones either, which will be tight, but it seems doable. Now I have the Oculus hardware modeled out in 3D space and the FOV cones coming off the tracking cameras created. Next up, I need to place the additional new hardware I want in the enclosure relative to the Oculus model itself. If you remember from the last episode, this is actually an AR simulator that will have hand tracking and forward facing camera hardware integrated into it. The hand tracking system I will be using is the UltraLeap IR170, which is a little bar that will go in under my forward facing cameras. The forward facing camera I'm using here is a Stereolab Z Mini, which will supply a high resolution video feed back to the Oculus. Both those modules have to tuck inside the space created by the field of view cones coming off the Oculus. It's a tight fit, but it looks like everything is working out so far. For now, I'm just placing those parts in 3D space with no supports, but I will go back in and draw a bracket for those once I have a better idea about the headset details. All this is just establishing the hard points that I will model around in the next steps. So yeah, this is actually great. I can use these FOV cones at each of the four corners of the design to hew out chunks from my custom enclosure. Sort of like cutting out geometry from a block of clay. Whenever functional constraints like this start coming into play, it almost always makes the final design better. It sort of just cranks up the level of ingenuity you have to bring to the table and forces creative solutions out of you. I'm now shelling out the enclosure to make sure I'm thinking about the internal space I have to work with to fit my hardware into. I'm also starting to get into those carbon fiber infill parts. Those will need to be machined out of 2mm carbon fiber sheet stock, so I have to create a lip in the main enclosure to receive all those plates. You can see I also surrounded all the camera lenses on this thing with 3D printed parts. There are 10 cameras shooting out of this guy now that the Oculus Z Mini and Ultra Leap are in place. 
any of those are out of alignment, and they will be, I can hopefully just make an adjustment to those small 3D printed parts instead of uh, reprinting the entire enclosure or having to recut all the carbon fiber parts. I'm now getting into the lip that will receive the custom face gasket. This lip will run along the entire enclosure edge and capture the soft gasket material. Now I haven't really thought through how this whole thing will stay on my head when I'm wearing it. Uh, so I developed out some side arms that will receive my cord strap concept. I want these to be able to pivot up and down a fixed amount so I created some guide slots that will make that action happen. There will need to be additional 3D printed parts here to receive my attachment screws and also allow wires to be fed out to the headphones. The second drop down arm will be my headphone mount. I want this to be able to slide and pivot along the main arm. This will make it so I can adjust the headphone position for best fit once I have it on my head. You can see I jumped over to do some refinement on the camera tracking surround parts. I tend to do this in CAD work. We'll develop out an area, then hop to a different location within the model when I get something I need to think more about. With that done, I'm back to the slide track for the headphone mount. This has a bunch of moving parts doing different motions, so coming up with the right parts and the right materials is a big challenge. I actually really love this puzzle solving aspect of CAD and doing stuff like this. You think you have a solution, then realize the parts are going to hit or the hardware won't fit and have to come up with a totally different solution on the fly. It's really satisfying when it all comes together. With the arm components in place, I am revisiting the connection area to the actual enclosure. I realized I wasn't going to get the amount of rotation I wanted out of the arm, so I did some updates to get a larger angle of adjustment out of it. Finally, I made an internal cap that will secure the arm on the assembly. This cap will spin with the arm and hold some threaded inserts so I can attach the arm with machine screws. Those screws are also in a nice position because they are not at the center pivot of the arm. Basically, they won't back themselves out and loosen as I move the arm over time. You probably also noticed I'm only building one side of the assembly. The enclosure is mostly symmetrical, so I can just mirror everything over to the other side once I'm happy with the design and save a whole lot of time. Alright, so I think I'm at a point where I need to stop for a second and review what I have so far. I exported the geometry out of Fusion and into Blender and did a basic camera rotation around the design with some materials applied that will reflect what the end result should look like. This helps me see if my overall proportions, material, and color choices are all still looking the way I want them to. You can see that camera tracking hardware is packed in there pretty tightly, but will still leave me enough room to run cables out of the enclosure. Generally, I'm really liking the way this is looking so far. It's pretty unique. I can't think of any other headset that looks like this and is only going to get weirder, so that's good. So right, you can look at the original concept sketch next to the CAD model I have right now and see the difference. As soon as I first started integrating the design constraints from the hardware, the form looked a lot more interesting. This is my favorite part of the design work, finding the hard constraints and physical interaction points and then playing around with them until you get something unique and purposeful. At first it looks like I totally ditched the sketch rendering I did in the last episode, but that's really what gave me my direction and material look for what's going on here now. Letting the function drive that form development, but maintaining the attitude that we first started with to create something new. So that wraps up the first round of basic form development. We covered a lot of ground in this one. We went from kind of a creative idea that was roughed out in the last episode to a solid start of the design done in CAD. Next episode, I'm going to do a one-to-one -one scale model of the design to make sure the proportions are working in real-world space before moving on. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.